for your lunch. Okay. So, so okay, I'm going to start. Is that too close? Oh, that's okay. That's okay, okay. So my name is um, so my name is Ian, and today I'm going to uh, present my talk uh, on harness and Chinese morphemes in learning other sanity languages like um, Hokkien or Cantonese and Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and sometimes uh, like a Tibet, also Tibetan vocab. Okay. So I'm going to present you the tradition of very old uh, Chinese um, text here. It's on the ox scapula, and uh, it has been, um, it's dated back to like almost 3,000 years ago. So you can see that uh, the, the Chinese people wrote their language on this kind of material. So everything, actually the Chinese morphine is a picture. So if you want to write a fish, what you do is basically draw a fish. So the so I don't know the pronunciation, but that doesn't really matter because that's a fish. And then in the Oracle script, it was written like this, like 3,000 years ago. So it still has a shape of a fish, a form of a fish, although it's a little bit changing. And then we wrote like this. And nowadays, I mean, at least in Taiwan or in Japan, I think, I mean, that's a regular script from a 200 AD. We write like this. So basically, it's just a picture of a fish. So, so it's very easy to learn Chinese. You, 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 you just draw it, right? Um, yeah. so, so Chinese characters, I mean, I don't want to give you an impression that Chinese characters or are only used or specific to China or, I mean, so it, it's actually an quite international writing system in East Asia and used in Sinaitic language, uh, speaking countries, uh, okay, uh, like um, mainland China and Taiwan. So I also don't want to get into too political here, but anyway, and also Singapore, uh, where also Chinese is spoken, and also Japan. And historically, and Korea and Vietnam also widely used uh, Chinese characters. And today in Korea, um, they still use Chinese characters to, to write their names, and in newspapers, sometimes you will find some. Um, Chinese characters, but they don't really use uh, that often as before. So if you want to know, I mean, what is, where is the head of the fish, the body of the fish, and the tail of the fish, you can still recognize that in the modern Chinese script. Okay. And what is the pronunciation? Is there anyone who learns? Yeah. But my answer is, I don't know. I don't know the pronunciation. It depends. If you read this character, I don't know the pronunciation. It doesn't really matter because every language has their own pronunciation. I mean, of course, in Mandarin Chinese, we say yu. In Cantonese, actually, actually, I don't know how to pronounce it, yu, I don't know. But in Taiwanese, Southern Ming or Taiwanese, we call it he. So it's totally different, but we still write this way. In Korea, it's o. In Vietnamese, it's ng. And in Japanese, you know that they always have different systems to pronounce the same character. So it can be sakana, that would be kunyomi, which means native Japanese pronunciation, or onyomi, which means Chinese type pronunciation, that would be gyo. And actually, there's another onyomi called uo, uo ichiba, for example, fish market. They, they will have another um, like a pronunciation. So how to pronounce this uh, character, it really depends. Okay, so now is the test time. So I'm going to present you. So we know how does fish look like in Chinese because it's just a fish. And I'm not telling you that tree looks like a tree in Chinese character. And where, whenever you see a character with the part of tree or fish, it means it's a kind of tree or it's a kind of fish. So I'm going to ask you whether it is a kind of tree or kind of fish. Fish. This one? Fish, this one? Tree, this one? Tree, this one? Tree, this one? Fish. Tree. Okay, and the last one? Okay, so I mean, the, um, I mean, in English, they have very different names. I mean, also in Mandarin Chinese, it's xue, gui, or qing, or man, but it doesn't really matter if you, if you read the Chinese text, you can 
automatically recognize whether that's a fish or a tree. Uh, do you really care what kind of fish? Uh, um, I mean, unless you are a specialist in, I don't know, in Chinese cuisine or whatever, then you don't really have to know that, right? So Chinese is not that difficult or, or Chinese characters. I mean, you, you, you just recognize one part of a character and you can categorize um, the characters. So if you go to Wikipedia, I mean, you will find this map, I mean, meaning it's the Chinese character sphere or Chinese character world, even though I don't really agree with this map, I, I'm going to tell you why. And there are four key, like a key elements, uh, not only Chinese characters in these countries, but also the political theory was Confucianism. It's a, I mean, ancient philosophical theory in China, like also like, I think more than 2,000 years ago. And the political system was centralization, not a centralization in, in, in the modern sense, but in the ancient sense. And the religion, which is important, is the Mahayana Buddhism from India. So I don't like this map. I like this map more. It, the reason is you can see the yellow part is where the Mahayana Buddhism dominates in this region in East China or central to East China, in Taiwan, in Vietnam, in Korea, and in Japan. And you can see that Tibet has another color. Uh, the reason is that Tibet has received an influence from India directly, so it didn't really pass the Central Asia to Afghanistan to, and then to China. Uh, so the Tibetan school, uh, the, the Buddhist school is different, and you can see the red part is the Southern Buddhism school from Sri Lanka, so they have um, different kind of language, so they read in Pali, in Tibet, of course, they read in Tibetan, and in China or in, I mean, Korea, um, in Japan, they use Chinese, uh, like the canon text. So if you go to YouTube and you, I mean, just copy paste these words, you can listen how people read Chinese Buddhist script, but in Korean and also in Japanese. Okay, so that's how the Mahayana Buddhism kind of spread from India. So you can see the red, actually I have to do this. I just forgot this. So the red, you can see that from India from to Central Asia and then to China and then to Korea, through Korea to Japan and also to Vietnam. So this country really share the common like Chinese character, culture and the Confucianism and this kind of thing. And from Tibet, you can see the blue lines here. So Tibet um, like received directly the influence from India. So I'm going to talk about Tibet, but I mean a little bit later. So I'm going to introduce you another character. Can anyone guess? If you are from China or Taiwan or whatever, then you don't say that. What does that mean? It's a child, it looks like a child. Why? Because it has a very big head and a very small body. So the proportion of body, I mean the head and body is like this, right? I mean, the baby always has a very big head. And in, in the Oracle script, you, you bone script, you write like this. And this is the modern um, version. Okay, so, so here is the body and here is the, the head. Okay, so when a child is born in a house, right? That is the house. What do you have to do? There's a newborn in the house that you want to give it a name, give him a name, right? So a newborn in a house actually means name. I don't know why, but actually that's how Chinese people at the beginning thought about names. So, so actually this, uh, this is words and name is written like this. And I'm going to give you another example here. Once the child is growing up, growing up, so now it's not a house, it's still a house, but actually it's a school. And you can see two hands here and placing something here. Actually this is called a counting rods. That's how the Chinese people 3,000 years ago, they learned how to count, I mean, mathematically. And these two hands belong to the hands of the teacher. So the teacher is showing the child how to count. What does that mean? It means actually teach and to learn, okay? Learn and teach, so then you write like this, and nowadays you write like this. So that's why I think um, traditional script is better than a simplified. The reason is, I mean, you have this many, you have the counting rods here, you have the teacher's hands here, you have your kid with a big head here, okay? So that's like this. Okay, you can have the teacher's hand, counting rods. And another Chinese character, so it's very 
easy. It's soil here, and there's a plant with green leaves kind of growing up. Okay, then you simplify this to two branches and another branch here. And what does that mean? It means to live, living. Okay, living. So I didn't tell the pronunciation because it doesn't really matter. What you have to do is to memorize the shape, the form, and the logic behind it. Okay. Now, now I'm going to introduce you maybe your first Chinese uh, term of vocab. So I just introduced that this is you can maybe you still remember this means living. You have these uh, leaves, a uh, branch, and the soil here. And you have your teacher's hand with counting rod with the big head and the big head a child here. It means to learn or knowledge. This is to grow. And I it's a little bit complicated in terms of the, I mean, how the characters come from. I just tell you it means thin, okay, so, uh, matter. So what is a living matter or living thin? It's a creature, okay. And the knowledge of a living thin is just biology. So Chinese is super easy. You just come in. I mean, you draw the pictures, and you combine them together, and you know the meaning. So what is the pronunciation again? I don't know. It so every language has their own pronunciation when they are reading these characters. Or in Japanese, seibutsukaku. In Korean, semurak. In Vietnamese, singbuk. In Mandarin, shenwuxie. And in uh, Taiwanese, so it sounds quite similar, uh, but you can you still s see the difference here, okay? So actually, it's pretty much like in Eng in the Western Europe, in Europe, right? I mean, you have biologia, I think that's in Latin, and it's from vios and logia, and from Greek, and combined them together. So you have biology, 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 biologia, 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 or something like that. So. It's pretty much, they are pretty much cognates. So Chinese kind of serves the role of Greek in East Asia. So now the problem is uh, biology is a very new concept. I mean, for like uh, China or East Asia, which has like 3,000 years of civilization. So when the Western knowledge first came, it was dated back in the 19th century. That's the first war between the UK and China, and that's the first time I think that China was uh, really realized that there, is a, that there was a superpower outside there. And for Japan, it's another way around. That's a, a, like a troop or a ferry from the US. It's called Kurofune Laiko, which means the arrival of the black ships. So you can see that the Japanese people still wearing their, in the Edo Jidai, they're still wearing their traditional suits, and they see black ships, big black ships from the US, and people were terrified in Tokyo, Edo, I mean, at that time they call it. And then people started to, okay, we have to learn, we have to learn the Western knowledge, because otherwise we will be, I mean, I don't know, like um, defeated, right? So, so in China, there was a so-called Western affair movement. You can see, I mean, people still wear these traditional, actually it's a Manchurian suit. But people learn how to produce uh, or to use the Western weapons. Um, as Taiwanese or Chinese, we know that it's a fellow of this movement. I mean, compared with the Japanese version, it's the uh, Meiji reform. So you can see that here is the emperor, Meiji Tenno here, standing here. And he is announcing a new constitution in Japan. So Japanese people not only adopted the Western weapons or this um, kind of the, um, craft stuff, but they also adopted new concepts. So that's where these concepts like uh, the biology, physics, science, they came to the Japanese vocabulary. So these words are so-called wase kango, which means the Japanese made Chinese vocab, okay? So there, are, there were many new concepts, for example, the world, okay? There was no word for world in Chinese, we, we call it maybe tianxia, which means, the, I mean, under the sun. But we didn't really say it's world. But in Buddhism, there was a word for world. It's a, but, but actually, it's a more temporal dimension, special dimension, so it's a little bit combined. But Japanese used this word referring to the world, I mean, uh, described by the Europeans. It's called, in Mandarin, 世界, Taiwanese, 世界, 世界 in Japanese, 世界 in Korean. 
And there's another world economy, which is purely uh, newly made by the um, Japanese people. So it's from a text, actually, that back almost 2,000 years ago. So Jingguo Jiming, which actually means governor state and benefit the people. So they, the Japanese people combine the govern and benefit together to translate political economy in English, I think. And then it became economy. So actually, it has nothing to do with finance or economy. Here you can see that. But nowadays, in all these East Asian languages, we call it Jinji, Ginze, Keizai, Kyongze. So pretty much the same, but actually, originally meaning was political economy. And then something happened after the reform. There was the war between these two, you can say, powers in East Asia. I mean, the Sino Japanese war between. China and Japan, you can see I mean, the Chinese people still uh, wears my UK okay, still wearing the traditional suits, even though they have new weapons and the Japanese, they already adopted everything from the West. And as the result, of course, I mean the uh, Japan won. And actually the political result of this is that Taiwan became a part of Japan. I mean so until today Taiwan still has a kind of an independence uh, I mean, it's, everything is, I mean, date back to uh, 1895. And at, at that time, a Chinese people think, okay, we have to learn from Japan. So that's why all these words came to Chinese as well. So it's kind of the backward from, Jap I mean, from Japan to China. So for example, 科学, Wissenschaft. Okay, actually, this is a translation from German. So actually, it means the um, knowledge of different disciplines. So you have Kushe, Kagaku, Kwahak, Kwahok, so in different uh, East Asian languages, like physics, constitution, democracy, republic, or religion, even religion, because we didn't have the word for religion because well, all we know is like uh, Confucianism or Buddhism, but for religion, a specific term, a general term for religion, really came from Japan and from Western countries. So it's a Zhongjiao, Xiukyo, Zhongyo, Tongzhao, okay? So basically they have the same, so, so it, it can be written in I mean, Chinese characters, but if you listen to the pronunciation, they might differ a bit. And also some examples that you might not think that's really modern, but actually that is modern for the East Asia, for example, safety. Anzen or Anzon, Antoine or Anquan in Mandarin. Jiankan health, okay, even health is like something a modern <laughs> concept. Kenko Konggang or museum is a park, it, they are like uh, European facilities. So you have Hakubutskan, Pamulguan, or Pa Koen Kongwon, Gongvian, an effect, or this, uh, like Xiao Guo, Koka, Hyogua, Hyogua. So you can, uh, so. Pretty much almost everything you will encounter nowadays, uh, I would say, were from this era. Okay, so how would you, if you know uh, an East Asian language, how can you kind of harness this history? Maybe tragic for Chinese people, but, <laughs> but I would say all for Taiwanese people, but uh, you can harness it, you can use it as a method. So first, I mean, you still have to know at least one East Asian language to have your repertoire of vocabulary. And you have to think about it, is that a modern concept? But, a, but the modern modernity I mean here is for the 19th century, people living in China or Japan, or, I mean, early 19th century. So almost everything is modern, right? So for example, Kwahak science is, you know, it's, if you are learning Korean, so you know Kwahak already, you say, okay, uh, it sounds a little bit like Sino-Korean, so maybe it's a new concept. So and you come to use this CJKV dictionary, I mean, by Emmanuel Ternon. So it combines different East Asian languages together. And you found, okay, the Chinese character is written like this. In Mandarin, it's pronounced like Kexue. In Japanese, Kagaku. And in Vietnamese, Kwa Ho. Okay? And the next step is important because normally, if you learn a language, you learn the vocabulary like this. Uh, that works in European language, but I don't know, when, when, when I was learning like a Slav, uh, Slavic languages, I still want to know the perfect root, you know, the word root of each word. So the next step is that you have to know what does that mean for each character. So it's good that in that dictionary you can know that, for example, for kwa, ke, or kwa, this word, it means 
department called section science, and you pick up, just pick up the first one as your understanding, okay? So department, and hack means to learn. So learning department or department learning, whatever, it's because it means that um, different disciplines of learning or knowledge. So that's science means for Chinese. So now you know what does that mean, what does that mean? And the next step is to amplify your words by using these two characters. For example, scientist, uh, in Korean, or in, in Chinese, or subject, and also, so, so, so if you start with ke, you will have this kind of words, but if you end with ke, for example, what is the eye department I mean, in a hospital? So we just call it eye department. It's ophthalmology, so how difficult English is. I mean, you have to learn another word, but in Chinese or in this language, you, you just have to know it's a, a department of eye or department of children, pediatrics, okay? So here you have the Greek uh, root or, I don't know, Latin root here. But in East Asia, we have Chinese root here. And for Xue, for example, you know it's learning, so knowledge is Hanmun, Gakumon, Haksen means the a student, Xue Shen, Gakuse, so everything like uh, is together. And Teagyo uh, means university, the big learning big knowledge or big learning means university, okay? So you learn big in university. I don't know whether that was your experience, but anyway. Daigaku or zhen dai ho, dai ho, okay? So in Vietnamese, you put a zhen here, so it, and you say zhen dai ho. So of course, I mean, these are different languages. They are not synetic languages, synetic languages. Um, so for, for Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese, uh, of course you can use this, and, but also for sanity languages, which means Chinese languages. So I would like to give you an impression that Chinese is not a language, but rather a language family. So while you are learning now, Mandarin is called the national language, or the language of the nation, I think the national language, in Taiwan it's called Guo Yu. In mainland China, people call it Putonghua, which means common tone. And it has a reason why Mandarin has been selected or has been selected as the like, um, standardized uh, Chinese or like, common tone. The reason is first that the emperor was living in Beijing. Okay? <laughs> the political center was in Beijing for many years, I think almost 800 years. And also Mandarin can be understood by these people living here. So these are the dialects of Mandarin from the Dongbei province to Hebei to, to southeast Yunnan here. So they all have their own dialects, but still they can understand Mandarin. So they are still, these languages are still Mandarin. Uh, okay, then I, want, I just want to add that in, uh, all languages now spoken in Taiwan are considered national languages or languages of the nation. So because this term is really politically charged, and so we don't like this, I mean, this guoyu, the national language, this term that much now. So normally we just say Zhongwen or Chinese, okay? So the problem for Taiwan is that now we have almost 40 national languages. So how can you teach that in, uh, at school? And the reason is actually, so we have three different kinds of Sinatic languages spoken in Taiwan. Taiwan is Mandarin, Taiwan is Hokkien, Taiwan is Hakka. This is the so we, we call Taiwanese. When we say Taiwanese, actually it means Taiwanese Hokkien or Southern Min, okay? And we have, I don't know how many of them, are like 30 Aboriginal formation, Aboriginal languages, which are very difficult to learn, very dif totally different. It has really no relationship with Chinese. Uh, they don't use Chinese characters, so it's a very, but it's a very interesting topic because all the languages from uh, here are very diverse, okay? So I want to, so here is the language map in Sinatic language, languages in China and in Taiwan here. You can see that in the southeast part, there are different language groups like, so Taiwanese here is actually from Min, which means Thousand Min or Hokkien, and Cantonese, you might know, is spoken in Hong Kong and um, in vicinity, the Guangdong province, and there are other languages here. Wu, for example, the Shanghainese is a Wu. They speak Wu, uh, Shanghainese in Shanghai. Uh, but still, they are also still language families, so they are different languages. For example, in Fujian province, actually there are one, two, three, four, five different languages here. 
I don't know, like northern means central means eastern means southern means, and they are not intelligible to each other, which means that if they meet together, they have to use English. <laughs> I mean, like 100 years ago, because it was that different. So the Taiwanese is basically southern mean, even though, I mean, politically, for political correctness in Taiwan, we tend to say Taiwanese, but uh, I don't want to give you an impression that it's totally different from southern mean, so they are very interrelated, and uh, this language is also spoken uh, in other places. Uh, so how different are these Sinaitic languages? So I want to give you some examples in Germanic languages, for example, in English, the pronoun is the I, you, we. In German, ich, du, wir. Swedish, ja, du, we. In Icelandic, ja, du, we. Okay, it sounds kind of similar. But in Mandarin, it's like wo, ni, woman. Especially we is very different. In Taiwanese, gua, di, dan. Okay, the characters here are still the, they are the same. In Cantonese, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, ngo, ne, ngo, dai. So it's a different, and in Shanghai it's a ngu, nong, so they use a different pronoun for you, and ala for we, why, I don't know, but ala songhening, so it's a, it's a we Shanghainese, so they have a very different pronoun in these Chinese languages. Uh, so, yeah. And important Sinatic languages, I would say, apart from Mandarin, of course, you, you will, if you learn Chinese, basically you learn Mandarin, and you have to learn Mandarin because it's the most important Chinese language, but don't forget other important Sinatic languages. For example, Cantonese, I think it's almost the second most important. It's spoken in Guangdong province, in Hong Kong, Macau, and diaspora, especially in the UK, in the, in the States. And Taiwanese Southern Ming or Southern Ming or Hokkien, is spoken in Fujian province, Taiwan, diaspora, especially in Malaysia, Singapore. So the Chinese community, they speak Taiwanese, Southern Ming, or Southern Ming. And Shanghai is spoken in Shanghai, of course. I mean, nowadays there are many, I mean, people from other provinces uh, living in Shanghai, so they don't really speak that much now. So if you learn Chinese, you know that there are four tones, right? And in Taiwanese, Hokkien, we have eight tones. And that's not, it's not the worst thing. The worst thing is the tone changes when they are in a sentence. So, you, if so for example, from two to one to one to seven, it's like a, it looks like a mathematical graph theory graph, but actually it's the tone map of Taiwan's Hokkien. You have to memorize this, and you have to memorize that when you speak, you have to change the tone. So I would say it's kind of a challenging uh, language. I speak English much better than my Taiwan's Hokkien, I have to admit. If you learn Taiwanese Hokkien, I mean, it's a public website by Taiwan's government, you still have to use Mandarin as your, like, a resource language to check Taiwanese Hokkien. I don't think there is available English Taiwanese or Taiwanese. I think there is a Taiwanese Japanese, but I'm not sure whether there is a Taiwanese English. So if you want to learn these languages, like the Sinaitic languages, still first, a first step is to learn Mandarin because then you can have the resources. So you hear the Hua Yu, you can see how the politics into place, and we don't want to say Zhongwen, we don't want to say, I mean, so we use the Hua Yu. Hua is a, uh, it also means Chinese, but it can refer to like a Chinese diaspora here. So you use Hua Yu, and then you can, for example, you uh, want to know how to pronounce, how to say signs in Taiwanese Hokkien, so you can see the Ku Hak, so, so then you can, you can have, and you also have audio here in the dictionary. Okay. You have the yeah, audio here. Okay, now I think it's the, almost the last part of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Sino-Tibetan languages. So, uh, so Tibet, Tibetan and Chinese has a very obscure relationship because they but they have very different um, cultural influence, so China has its own influence, and Tibet basically received influence directly from India, so there was a dispute of Buddhism, like, I don't know, like more than a thousand years ago, the king in Tibet had to decide whether he wanted to adopt the Chinese version Buddhism or the India version Buddhism, so there was uh, like a debate in Lhasa, the capital, I think that was in Lhasa, in the capital of Tibet, uh, and at the end of the day, the Indian monks won, so that's why the Tibet king decided to adopt or to learn the 
Indian, uh, Indian uh, Buddhism. And all the Tibet language, all the script was learned and based on I mean, Indian tradition here. So, maintenant, un peu de français ici. Comment on peut prendre? C'est quoi? Le corps, oui. Et le temps. So, we don't pronounce the PS here. We don't pronounce the PS here. The reason is, I mean, the French people wanted to retain the, I don't know, the Latin etymology here, right? So, the corpus, I don't know, the tempus here. So, they have this PS, PS here. Uh, for Tibetan, it was not like this, but they retain everything nowadays but they don't pronounce it, or they, the pronunciation change across the thousand year. For example, you have this K-R-O-K-S, -K but you don't pronounce crocs, okay? Maybe that was pronounced like this, it was pronounced like this a thousand years ago, but nowadays it's cho. It's very different, you spell crocs, but you pronounce cho. And this is even more weird, you write Z-L-A, so actually it should be pronounced like Sla, something like that, but in modern Tibetan, in Lhasa, you pronounce like Da, like D-A. So you have to memorize the rules how to pronounce Tibetan. Uh, so how to use or to harness Chinese morphemes. So here are the numbers from one to 10 in Chinese. Uh, in Tibetan, actually I forgot to put a transliteration here. So in Mandarin, you will say yi, er, san, si, wu, okay? And in Tibetan, ji, ni, sum, xi, nga. But the problem is, I mean, Mandarin doesn't sound really Tibetan, right? But if I read in Taiwanese, Hokkien, it will be ji, neng, sa, xi, ngo. Ji, ni, sum, xi, ji, neng, sa, xi. So actually, the Southeast um, Chinese languages like Hokkien, Cantonese, these are very archaic Chinese languages. Uh, so sometimes we can identify this word easily than the Mandarin speakers. But you can see that they have very different script here. And also, uh, I mean, that's basically from, so, 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 so the relationship is basically based on the old Chinese and old Tibetan. For example, SLP, I think it's called, uh, it's Lop, but, uh, uh, it's xi, actually, you know, xi uh, in Chinese, but in old Chinese you have to pronounce a lip, I don't know why. So scholars kind of found the relationships between old Chinese and old Tibetan. For example, poison, duk, in Chinese is du, uh, is nga in Chinese, wu, or in, if you remember, I just mentioned in Shankani is ngo, so it, is, it sounds kind of similar. Uh, hungry, jie. Uh, but in Chinese it's ji, so, but in ancient time, maybe both of them pronounced like krit. And name in Tibetan is min, in Chinese it's also min. And the friend is a crazy one, because in old Chinese I really don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know, I don't know. So it's good that we are living in a modern world and you don't have to learn Chinese, uh, old Chinese like this. Uh, <laughs> and happy. Uh, in Tibetan is git or kippo, so in Chinese, actually this word also means something good, is ji in Mandarin, but in git in Old Chinese, okay? So in Old Chinese there was no tone, but you have this weird consonants here. And the consonants, I mean people say, or the scholars say that the consonants here and here disappear and they become tones, okay? So you have to choose either to have this weird consonant or have tones. I would say tone is much simpler, right? I mean, I mean, that would be, it sounds too difficult for me. Yeah, so that's all about it. I will thank you and I'm welcome for your questions. Okay. So, so far I see we don't have questions. Um, if you want to ask a question, just follow the instructions, go on style.com, enter Babel, and you can also vote on the given questions once they are there. Okay, I mean, there's, there's someone raising hand. <coughs> can, can't yeah. you type it in? It would be much easier also for people to follow it. Can you use Slido or do you need the microphone? No, no, there I We need to take, take it for the stream. But I really encourage you to use Slido. It's, if you have problems, I can. 
I just have rather a technical question. Uh, is it possible to have a look at some notes or the materials that were presented here after it's finished? I just got in here late and would love to see what topics were talked about. Uh, so, so sorry, you want to have a note? Or? Uh, yeah, maybe like look at the materials that were being presented here or yeah. some notes because I got in late and I'm, I didn't know it was only going to be for 45 minutes. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if there's no question, we don't need to force it. Okay, no question. Um, is there a problem to use Slido? What is do, do you want to use the app? I don't know, because I was instructed ah, to use the, okay. In pronounce, what is the either? No, no, it's, that, it's the common ancestor. No, I mean, they are not, I mean, the similarity pronunciation is only um, this Chinese-based language, uh, like vocab. So Korea and Japanese, they have very different, I mean, they, have, they, they are different languages. They are different language families. Uh, so, and Vietnamese, as far as I know, is also a different language family. So it was a pen for Korean and Japanese when they had to learn uh, Chinese because Chinese is an ASVO language, but in Japanese and Korean is ASOV. So they have to read Chinese, but reversely. So we didn't go into that. Uh, do you know whether the specific terms in Mandarin Chinese develop? Oh, okay based on the vowels, consonants in old Chinese. I don't know, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> so I'm not linguistic. So. Uh, how much would you recommend Middle or Old Chinese as opposed to Canada or Hokkien to see this old relation? Ah, yeah, I will recommend Hokkien. Uh, the reason is we still use very old version of Chinese in our daily speech. Uh, for example, I will refer you, uh, I don't know whether there's there are people who speak Japanese here. Hi. For example, when you say run, to run, in Japanese you say hashiru, right? And you write the character in zo, uh, actually, in Mandarin. But zo uh, in Mandarin now, it means to walk, to go. But in Hokkien, it still means to run, zo. And in old Chinese or in ancient Chinese, it actually, it meant uh, to, to, to run. Um, and I also want to, can I use that, that white? No, I can't. I'm sorry? Can I use the white, uh, white papers? Sure. Yeah. yeah. For okay, maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe it doesn't really matter, but I mean, so, so do you know how to say brother in Mandarin Chinese? Gogo, right? Gogo. And in Japanese? It's good, right? But actually, in Japanese, it's like uh, you have to write like this. This one is the, the real Chinese version. This one comes from Turkish -like language, Go. So if it's a Kazakhstan, I think you say Aga, or I don't know. So I don't know, yet, a thousand years ago, because the Turks people were living in North China, right? So Chinese people kind of adopted the pronunciation, like Go to refer to brother, or actually father, at the original meaning. Um, and also there is a called die, niang. That's also in northern, I don't know, in Beijing, I don't know, you say die, niang, right? Actually, it's also from Turkish. It's anne in Turkish. Atta, Turk, atta, also means uh, father. Now, I think in Turkey it's a baba, I don't know, but um, you know atta, Turk, there's an atta, Turk airport, right? So it's die, niang, actually it's from Turkish. But in Hokkien, we still use xion, we still, we still use the original Chinese version, like ah here, here, so we still use this. So it's like in Korean, we say hyung, right? So we still use this, right, hyung. So that's why I recommend uh, Taiwanese Hokkien, and I also recommend that because now in Taiwan it's standardized, so it's easy to learn, easy to use. We have textbooks, you have, maybe you have online lessons or courses taught in National University of Taiwan, so you can really learn that, even though it's a little bit, I don't know, a little bit politi politically, political, because I mean, yeah, for, for, for many reasons, but whatever, whatever uh, I would say that that's a very good start for you if you want to know uh, how that's sounded, I mean, 
But I have to mention that, I mean, Hokkien is, is also a mod, it's still a modern language. It's not uh, old Chinese, okay? But it, it, it's just a very archaic Chinese language. Why did the Koreans forego Chinese characters and start using Hangul? I can't, <laughs> I think that's uh, for Korean people. I mean, so, um, so as far as I know, they, okay, I mean, they, they so, so obviously, not only Korean people, Vietnam as well, and for some Taiwanese people, they want to. I mean, I think it's more a political reason than a linguistical reason. And if, of course, I mean, for Korea, it's possible because um, if you use hunger, you can still kind of listen the difference. But there will be there, there, will, there will be many things sound likely, but written differently in Chinese characters, but sound the same in Korean. Uh, but in Japan or in Japanese, this situation is more often so. Japanese can't really kind of forego, you know, a Chinese um, character because that would be too difficult to comprehend. The Vietnamese and Mandarin usually have the same number of syllables for a given word. Yes, and that's quite interesting. I mean, Vietnamese also has a very short, I mean, yeah, I mean, almost always like one syllable or two syllables. Have you ever met a non-native speaker with accentless Chinese, I do have actually. I mean, almost accentless. I mean, uh, yes, I do. How can we use this? There are quite many actually. I read somewhere that Shanghainese can be considered to have pitch accent rather than tone. That's correct. Can you speak to that? That's correct because, uh, for example, uh, it's kind of the. It's a little bit like Japanese, you know, that Shanghainese, uh, Shanghainese, or uh, for example. So, so, so it's like, uh, you know, the melody. Uh, it's not really a tone. I can't really say it's a tone. Uh, if you have another question regarding Shanghai, I can introduce to my grandmother, who is 95 years old, who is a native speaker of Shanghainese. Uh, what are some false friends regarding Chinese characters, meaning characters that mean different things in different languages? They are quite a lot, uh, especially between Japanese and uh, Chinese. Uh, for example, uh, Sorry? So I, I can't. Tegami, tegami, hi. Tegami, shouzi, shouzi. But I think it has a mainland. Shouzi is like a toilet paper. <laughs> but in Japanese, it's a letter. Okay, you write a letter, so tegami, that's correct. Shouzi, uh, but yeah. So, so you have to pay attention uh, to that. But tegami, for example, tegami is a onyomi, uh, it's a kunyomi word. So you write Chinese, uh, Chinese characters, but you pronounce, you use the original pure Japanese pronunciation. So in that case, I mean, the meaning can be quite different. How do you use Briar? Yes, uh, since the pronunciation is kind of obsolete. I don't know, I, I don't know. They have, that, 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 this question, I really don't know, sorry. Can you share some of the source of learning different Chinese languages that are mostly available in Chinese? Yes, I can do that, but basically, I think um, you still have to know Mandarin. Uh, I have to check. I mean, for Taiwanese, I definitely know some, and for Cantonese, I also know some. I mean, there are many YouTubers on YouTube teaching Cantonese now, and normally they have English subtitles. Would you mind explaining four tonalities in Chinese? Okay. Okay, so, so, so just a two, so, so, so it's just like sing a song. I mean, that's very, fairly easy. So you have this uh, form, I don't know. You have this, right? So I don't know why it's not very, I don't have ink now. So you have this, for example, the first sound is like, ah, so you don't really change the tone. And then from low to high, Ah, uh, and the fourth term is from high to low, huh? And then you have the third tone, that's a little, huh? So you go down first and a little bit going up a little bit, okay? And that's how we write in tones like uh, this, like, like this, or this, or this. So it's quite, um, compared to, compared with Vietnamese, it's uh, easy, or Cantonese, or Hokkien, or Taiwanese is a very easy system in Mandarin. So that's also the reason why you really want to learn Mandarin as your first Chinese or
Do Taiwanese people usually recognize wase kango? Japanese people usually don't know which word is made in Japanese. No, uh, actually Japanese people know that. I think they learned that at school. <laughs> they know that they influenced China. But in Taiwan, we didn't, or in China, I think we didn't know that because <laughs> we didn't want to give the, I don't know, the students the impression that we were influenced by Japan. I don't know, maybe that's a reason. So I learned that after growing up. And I read, oh yeah, I mean, that's kind of the Japanese influence, yeah. When the Venom is interruption, if you, you answered the question, right? I answered the question. I'm just telling you, uh, I am leaving the questions for one minute open because we also want to go to lunch. Then one minute uh, questions are, new questions can be added for one minute and then we just answer all the rest of the questions. Yeah, okay. Okay? Okay, so William asks, when the Vietnamese used Chinese characters, did they use the same characters for words that are now used in modern standard Chinese? Yes, uh, talk about, uh, and, and wait, a, wait a minute, I haven't <laughs> answered that. I mean, but they have their own system. It's called the norm or Zinan. So they created their own characters in Vietnamese. So that's a very interesting system. Uh, so they combined the two together. They wrote the two. But in the official text, I think they still use the like, um, classical Chinese as a media. Uh, was using Chinese characters at the word level, any way to use this at the sentence level. I don't think it's possible to use at, uh, in the sentence level because Korean, for example, is a very different language. They just, you, it, it's just like, like, for example, biology. You, you use these words, like it's a Greek base, but you don't use the Greek grammar, right, in English. But you kind of use, so, so, so it's pretty much the same thing. So Korean and Japanese are just totally different languages with very different grammar. For me, it's very difficult to master because they have very difficult honorific uh, system. So, so basically, the vocab level, how can we use this information to help us in our language learning? So the thing is that, uh, so the thing is, so, so, so as I show you, there's the four steps. So you still have to learn at least one East Asian language. And then you recognize the vocab. When you learn uh, your next East Asian language, you can think, OK, maybe I can use this information to build up my vocabulary. So I think that's the take home here. For a Hakka speaker, yes. Is there any Hakka speaker here? That's nice. OK, OK. You're a Hakka. Where do you come from? Okay, that's great. That's great. Actually, I'm also half Hakka, but I don't really speak Hakka, so, uh, so so I didn't put Hakka information here. So we are like Hokkien speaking Hakka. So, yes, is there any app or so you could recommend to learn master Chinese? I have to check uh, I, to learn. I think there are many. Learning non-Mandarin Cantonese Chinese language can be seen as a technical problem. Yes, do you know any good things for Wu Chinese? I know one, but um, that's, uh, that's based in China, but I don't think that's a really good one. Um, I think that's available. There are also audio files here there, so you can listen to the, to the, uh, to the audios. But the thing is, I think the written language is not really standardized in Shanghainese, so everyone writes in its own way, uh, yeah. Do the languages share a common sentence structure? I would say pretty much, I mean, in a Chinese language, pretty much the same thing. Um, but you have to pay, uh, pay attention. The basic, the core uh, vocab can be very different. As I just showed you, the, the, the pronouns, for example, or the very basic uh, verbs like to give, to get, to eat, they differ, actually. Uh, for example, chi in Mandarin, but jia in, 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 in uh, Hokkien, and actually these are or Taiwanese, uh, and they are very different. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, so 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 it's just a different language, yeah. But it's the com the sentence structure, I would say, is pretty much very similar. They are very very similar, yeah. Okay, I think that's the last question here, or is that no? The example of a used sentence. Place no, no, I'm in sorry. The uh, sorry, we, this is a moderated question for review. Yes. No. 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 So we are, we are over now. This was all okay. the questions we could uh, answer because okay. we are ending our talk at 45. Um, but you feel free to just come to the speaker yeah, and ask your questions. Uh, now we go to the lunch break, and here the talk continues at 3 p.m. Thank you.